Imagine being able to just send out $10 and all of a sudden $100 comes back. I mean, that's the, that's the ultimate dream of any investor. Now, when we think about real estate, oftentimes it said, hey, you gotta start off in wholesaling, make a little money, go to flips, and then you got a couple of flips, and then you, you go to single family rentals, and then from there, you can go into commercial real estate, and then finally, once you own all of this real estate and have all this experience, then you can finally become a private money lender. So in today's video, we're gonna cover everything about becoming your own private money lender. Everything from setting up the LLC, the documents you need to protect yourself, the process you need to go through, and then some other strategies as far as where to find that money. So when it comes to private money lending, one of the big recommendations is stick to areas or relationships that you trust. Oftentimes when people get into investing, they get the shiny object syndrome, right? And, and there's some good salespeople out there in the world. There's some people who can sell you on an idea, give them your last dollar and your last breath and hell, maybe even sign over your firstborn. But just because all that talk and hype sounds good doesn't always mean that the investment is a good choice. So when it comes to lending, I recommend that you stick to areas that you know first off, right? This can be areas that you grew up, that you visited free frequently that you have friends and family in or the areas that you live in personally. Next, you only wanna focus on the assets that you're actually comfortable with. So if your experience is in the single family space, then you definitely should not be lending money in the industrial space. I mean, worst case scenario as a private money lender, let's say that they foreclose and you get that property. But now you have no idea what to do with it as an investor. And the last one is working with people that you actually trust. Now, later on in the video, we're gonna go over all the documents you need and how to actually vet these borrowers. So making sure that you can learn to trust them. But in all honesty, we know oftentimes Sometimes we get a feeling when we're sitting down in front of somebody. After a few conversations, if you're a little iffy at all, just stick to your gut and just say no. The idea of money is not worth the headache of working with somebody that you don't trust. I'm speaking from experience. One of the things that's most commonly misunderstood in the entrepreneurial journey is that now that we're selling products or services or access to money, we are now liable for some difference of opinions potentially in any relationship that we engage in. What I mean is if they don't like you, they can see you. So rule number one to every business is learn how to protect yourself. And then one of the easiest ways to do that is by actually setting up an LLC. And if you wanna learn more about setting up an LLC, I actually got a video for you. It's down in the description below. So the purpose of that LLC is really to create separation, right? From anything that happens within the business to your personal life, so your house, your car, your, your child's college fund, none of that is actually at risk. So after you separate the liabilities, you wanna make sure that you can seek uh, litigation if you needed to. And every state is different. So I don't know every state's laws, and oftentimes as a business, there's different options than if you were to pursue anything in your personal name. And speaking of state, you wanna make sure that you're checking your state's usury laws because oftentimes a state may dictate to what extent can you actually charge interest. For example, they may say that you cannot charge anything more than 23%, otherwise it's predatory lending. Now that we got the baseline, let's talk about the four critical documents that you need before you lend anybody any money. The first one is a promissory note. Now this, this is that agreement between you and the borrower laying out all the terms of the money. How much money is it? What's the interest rate? Are you collecting monthly payments? Is it interest only? Is it amortized? When is it actually due? And the list goes on and on and on. So anything that you want, any restrictions or any stipulations that you want to the loan, that's where you're gonna put it. You're gonna put it in that promissory note. Now that second item, that's gonna be a mortgage or a deed of trust. And so what this says is now this house essentially secures my loan. Loan. So if you don't pay me, I can foreclose and I can get this property. Now this is an important section to note because we're going to talk about how to analyze the property and the borrower. But if you got an asset right and you know that it's worth two hundred thousand, but your private money loan is only a hundred thousand, well now you know a two hundred thousand dollar asset secures your loan now. So this can be a place of uh, you know safety, of comfort, this, that, and the third, but a mortgage or a deed of trust is gonna be absolutely necessary. The third item that you're gonna want is you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you or your company is listed on the insurance as a lost payee. This will allow you to get paid even if a hurricane, a tornado, or anything else happens to the property. This actually saved my ass on a subject two deal I had. I was just about to refinance the property. I held the subject two for maybe two years and then a tropical storm came through and knocked down a branch from a tree and it was a fairly large branch knocked a significantly sized hole in the roof took down the gutter and we had to get it all replaced at the moment because it was subject to it was my property at that time the original owner wasn't gonna pay for any repairs and I did not want to have to pay I think it was like 
 12,000 or 11,000 dollars just to fix that piece of the roof. So luckily because I was a lost payee, we still were able to go through the original owner to place the insurance claim and it all got fixed. But in the instance that that house was deemed, you know, irreplaceable or irreparable as a lost payee on there, I still would have been able to get paid out. And so if you want a video about subject two or about that deal very specifically, let me know in the comments. But let's get back to this. And the fourth thing that you're gonna want, and it's extremely important, is a personal guarantee. Now the personal guarantee typically can be wrapped into the promissory note. So it can be one document, promissory note, with a section that has a personal guarantee in it. And you're gonna hear a lot of investors go around and saying, hey, I want non-recourse debt. I, I, I prefer non-recourse debt. What non-recourse debt means is that there is no personal guarantee. Essentially, if that property failed, then only the property can satisfy itself, right? We're not gonna go for you to satisfy the rest of that loan. But what many people don't realize is non-recourse debt is typically reserved for assets of significant size or investors of significant experience. So most of the time, a personal guarantee is going to be attached to a ton of these mortgages and your private money should absolutely have a personal guarantee as well. Now you know what time it is, guys. If you find this valuable and you want to continue to support Mike, now's the time to hit the like. Let's go into the next section. Now most people interested in lending private money have issues in one specific area and that's vetting the borrower. So let's list a few different things that you can do to make sure that your money is going to somebody who you can trust. The first thing I like to ask for is like a credibility pack, essentially a track record of all your experience. Sometimes this might come in a beautiful packet, you know, if they're really got everything in order, it might look like a pamphlet uh, of sorts or a brochure, headshots with executive summaries and different photos of before and afters. Other times it could be an Excel spreadsheet, which is, hey, here's the deal, here's the date, here's how much money I made. Either way it goes, you wanna actually be able to look at those properties and you wanna see some of those numbers. What'd you buy it for? How much did you put into it? How much did you get out of it? What was your margin of safety? You know, was it a large profit or did you borrow $50,000 just to make a $5,000 profit. At the same time, this gives you the opportunity to go back and verify that they actually did own those properties. Remember how I mentioned, you know, working in areas that you know? Well, if you're familiar with the area, then you can understand how to research the tax code, how to actually look at the county register of deeds to see if the ownership ever did pass through the hands of his entity or his name. Now, after you have that credibility packet and you kind of dug in there, now it's time to search for review. Are there any open market reviews, anything on Facebook? Facebook, anything on Google, do they have a website? When individuals have something that's open to the public, it allows you to get a glimpse of how people really feel about it. Because and oftentimes, yeah, 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 there's a ton of people that say, hey, call their friends, they call their family, hey, send me a Google review, man, give me five stars. And all they do is get a thumbs up there with five stars. Say, great service. <laughs> That's not the case. That's not what we're looking for, right? We want authentic reviews from the homeowners, from other private money lenders to see what's the culture like? How much value do they actually offer? After you look at them and their business model holistically, now it's time to go into analyzing the property itself. This again plays into knowing your area and the assets very well because if they come to you with a commercial property and you can't evaluate it yourself to make sure that the numbers make sense, well then you're putting yourself in a very bad situation. So based on your understanding of the market and your understanding of the asset class, now you can double check their numbers and verify the accuracy of them. While you're analyzing this property as well, you wanna go back and look at the value of the overall property versus how much you are lending. So if you've seen some of my other videos, we talk about a lender only doing 70% loan to value or 80% loan to value. And the reason why is because they need to protect themselves. They have to have that 20 or 30% equity position. So if they have to rapidly sell off the property, they can at least get their money back. And so the same thing applies to you because you are now the bank. You don't want to lend 100% of a project without being able to secure or hedge the risk of losing all of your money. Which brings us into the next thing that you want to verify is their proof of funds. When we're looking at their proof of funds, you want to make sure that they actually have enough to cover whatever the rest of the project is, excluding the amount of money that you're actually going to lend them. So let's say that the overall project was $150,000 you are gonna lend them $100,000, and the overall after repair value is gonna be $200,000. Now in this situation, you can see that your $100,000 would be secured potentially by an asset once the renovations are done, twice the amount that you've lended. So that may seem like it's a safe portion of investing or a way to hedge your risk. Now let's say that that same borrower showed you proof of funds of only $20,000. Well, if the whole project costs 150 and you're putting in 100,000, he only has 20, 
If he does actually close on this property, that means he had to borrow another $30,000. Now there's an age old argument about this. Does more leverage increase your risk or decrease your risk? Now I hear many borrowers, many investors that are doing the buying, they say that it decreases their risk. Why? Because if everything falls apart, well then they only lost $20,000 in this scenario. Now my argument along with many other real estate professionals and financiers would say that you as a borrower taking on more leverage increases your risk. But this is even more true as a lender. More of the money that you put in, knowing that your borrower is increasing leverage, puts your money at risk. Reason one. Now there's multiple lenders in the pie, so how do you determine how much you get? Now typically this is through lien positions, but nonetheless, that's now a new conversation you have to have. Number two, let's say he is one of those borrowers that just doesn't care about losing $20,000. Well now, you potentially can lose $100,000 and even may be stuck with the property and that's not what you want to do anymore. So look at the proof of funds and then the final thing that you want to always ensure that you do is have an attorney review all of the documents that you have before they sign off on it and when you close make sure that the attorney is actually recording your promissory note and your deed of trust with the county register of deeds. So from the beginning to now you're all set. You can now operate as a private money lender. You can be your own bank. But now the question is where do I find the money? Even if you had $50,000 in the bank right now if that's kind of like your rainy day fund, most investors don't want to lend that money out. They want to keep it secure just in case. So I'm briefly going to touch on five different areas where you can pull out money to start lending now. The first one is going to be any type of self-directed retirement account. So instead of going to an employer retirement account where you're kind of limited on what you can invest in, self-directed is owned and operated by another brokerage that allows you to put your money wherever you want to include in real estate or private money lending. The beautiful part about this is as you're starting to gain interest off of those loans, those are all accumulating in your retirement account. So essentially you're making your retirement account grow. Now here's a little tip as to how it starts to get real sexy. Imagine if you had a Roth IRA, meaning its income was taxed before the money ever went in there. So now it's growing, it's growing tax free. And you got all of these payments just continuing to compound over time tax free. The second way you can do it is through your brokerage accounts. And these are just gonna be open accounts where you're investing in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, so forth and so on. So yes, you can take out the money and then invest it. But when you do that, you get capital gains tax, you get all kinds of sales fees and so forth and so on. But what the wealthy people do is they just take a loan against their brokerage account. Now this type of loan is often called a marginal loan, which says, hey, look, we're gonna give you X amount for a loan based on your equity holdings. But at that point, you now have a loan against something that is potentially volatile, right? We've all seen that stock market just, boo -boo, just drop away at some point in time. So if we were to take a loan against that and the market drops, well, now they're gonna have a margin call. We gotta pay all that money back. So it may not be the best option, but it is a option. Now, number three is gonna be any equity inside of your home. Yes, if you had enough equity, you could refinance the home and take out a lump of cash tax-free and then use that to invest. But when you do that, you kind of restart your whole loan cycle again. So now you may have paid off for 10 years, but it's gonna start over at 30 years. You gotta reset the interest rate and blah, 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 blah. Now, although that's a good option, you can also consider a home equity line of credit, which is essentially like a credit card. And they're gonna say, hey, we're gonna have it open for 10 years. You can go out there and swipe it as much as you want, as long as you pay it back. And the best part about that is typically the interest rate is very comparative to your home mortgage loan. So instead of getting a credit card for 19 or 20%, you can get a home equity line of credit from four to 8%. Now, number four, we're gonna stay in the realm of lines of credit, but this one is going to be a business line of credit. So now if you're operating as a business, like we discussed, you have your articles of incorporation, you have your EIN number and all that good stuff. Well, now you can go out and apply for a business line of credit. Now that business line of credit comes in many shapes and forms. It could be a two-year term, a 10-year term. It could be interest only. It could be whatever. But now with that loan, as long as you're charging more interest on your private money loans, well, then you can actually collect the margin on those and you don't have to come out of your own pocket to support apply those loans. And the fifth way to find more money, which a lot of people don't even consider, is actually using other private money. That's right. You can have private investors that lend you money to help them then lend money. And the reason they do this is because those private investors may not know real estate. They may not want the hassle of actually going and underwriting these deals and vetting these borrowers like you're going to do, but they still want that same return. So what they're going to do is they're going to lend the money to you and then you would just return their interest.
interest. It's very similar to syndication, but instead of actually buying assets, you're just lending the money. Now, if these creative ways to find money really intrigue you, then I want you to go ahead and check out the video in the description below, which is five ways to fund your next real estate deal. And you might be surprised at some of the strategies that we list out there. All of this that we discussed, there's one really important thing to always remember. When it comes to private money lending, the risk, it lies with your ability to actually underwrite, whether it's the property, the area, or the borrower. So make sure that you're really considerate about how you want to screen these individuals. So besides watching the video in the description below, YouTube is gonna recommend a video right along here, and you probably should hit it next.